Hi, and welcome to Philosophy with Phil, with me, Phil Cohen. For this video, I want to talk about the Torah. Um, the Torah, I appreciate, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, as the old joke goes, you have two rabbis, uh, three opinions. Uh, some might say uh, three is a, is, a, is a best guess, and it's an underestimate of, of how many different opinions they have. Um, but uh, my hope is that by sort of keeping a high level view, we can paint some broad brushstrokes, which will sort of encapsulate the majority of, of, of the views. Um, we're going to start um, being a bit abstract, a bit what you might call Kabbalistic, um, and then sort of diving down a bit deeper to a more tangible, more, more practical approach. So please do bear with me. We're going to start, believe it or not, with the creation of the universe. Um, because when God, which is a purely spiritual entity, created the world, the universe, which is, uh, has a, is, is, a, is a physical entity with a spiritual dimension to it as well, um, God had to undergo an element of for lack of a better word contraction or constriction to make way for this physical entity it's a process in judaism um in, in kabbalah that they, they, they call um simpson now this is something that's very easy to misunderstand and i really don't want to go into it in too much detail because it it it, it it's it's very hotly contested. Um, there's different opinions as to how this um, what what this actually looks like, what God's relationship is with the physical world, what that means, um, and, and and really that's not not for the the, the scope of this this video. Um, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that there is you know the physical world occupies a space where God is not. That's completely counter to what Judaism holds. Um, quite the opposite god, god is god is a strong part of that and the whole role of judaism the whole role of, of doing mitzvahs is to is to unleash that if you like but what happened during that contraction as i say is part of um it, it, there are many kabbalistic texts that are written about it but the process through which that happened and that a spiritual, the spiritual entity of the world, God, was able to bring into existence a physical entity, that process happened through a procedure, a set of rules. And those rules are what we call Torah and mitzvahs. And that is what we mean by saying that God keeps the Torah, God keeps mitzvahs. And that is how there's a famous midrash that says that um, God looked into the Torah and used that as his blueprint for creating, creating the world. So mitzvahs, what we call Torah and mitzvahs, are that rule book for creating worlds. Okay. And that is why, by learning the Torah, we are able to get an insight into the mind of God. That is what the Torah is. It's a crystallization of the mind of God, because this is what Hashem used, if you like, for, for creating the world. It's like a, an engineer's drawing plan um, for the world. And by understanding the drawing, we can understand what was going on in the engineer's mind, so to speak, when he first drew up the designs, when he first came, brought about, wanted to, wanted to create this, this new creation. This hopefully explains why when we learn Torah, it can be very nitpicky and very finicky. You often hear in Gomorrah discussions about very obtuse, seemingly irrelevant, seemingly unimportant details. But what we're trying to understand is that boundary point between what is within Torah and the scope of Torah and what is outside of it. So let me give you a simple example. 
we light candles on on Hanukkah. And the, that's a, that's a, that's a mitzvah. It's not in the Torah, but the rabbis have, have enacted it following the the um, the events of the Hanukkah story. But if one were to light a candle, let's say on another day of the year, that would be outside of the Torah. So what is the difference between lighting a candle before Hanukkah and on Hanukkah? Well, when you're lighting the candle on Hanukkah, you're doing the mitzvah of Hanukkah. You make the brach- the brachas, the brachot. And that is the mitzvah. And there's all sorts of laws about how long it needs to last and what sort of oils to use and what sort of wick and, 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 and where it needs to be placed and all of that sort of thing. But that minute detail, which can be a matter of minutes or, or perhaps an hour or two, if you were to light it too early, you're just lighting a regular candle. That's outside of the scope of Torah. Whereas if you were to light it at the right time, in the right place, in the right way, that's within the scope of Torah. So oftentimes what we're trying to do, particularly in Talmud and Gomorrah, is trying to get that right. Trying to understand what is in the uh, scope of Torah and what is outside. And that difference can be very, very tight. And often the Gomorrah, the Talmud, will often bring up thought experiments, which more than likely never happened, but get get you to think and get you to pinpoint precisely where it is, that boundary is, between what is within the scope of the Torah, what is in within the scope of, of what the, the rabbis understood to be the scope of the Torah, and what is outside, and what is just li- literally just lighting candles. Because we can light candles all we like. But it's the only by lighting candles in the way that prescribed by the Torah that helps us to fulfill the mitzvahs. And that goes for all of the mitzvahs, as shame as blowing the, the, the shofar. The rabbis go on to what happens if you blow the shofar not on Rosh Hashanah. What happens if you blow the shofar outside of the davening? What happens if you walk past a field and someone's just blowing the shofar? What what happens? What, what exactly is within the scope of that mitzvah and what sits outside of it? Why? Because we're trying to understand the mind of God. We're trying to understand this rule book that Hashem used, that God used to create the world. What didn't, wasn't involved and what is. And that detail, that difference can be absolutely minuscule. And as I say, that's why it's it's often these, the, the, the thought experiments, the case studies, if you like, used in the Gomorrah are so abstract. And perhaps never happened because it doesn't matter whether they happened or not. By getting to the, by finding by finding details in that in that case, in that thought experiment, that make it different from another thought experiment, we can understand where that difference lies and what is in, what is in and outside of the scope of that. Because of that nature of the Torah, the Torah is infinite, by definition, and that is why it's. Often people complain about the level of detail that mitzvahs go into, even down to things like getting dressed in the morning. The details of, of how you pick up a lulav and an and, and esrog and the, the, the four species on, 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 on sukkahs and what, what a sukkah can be made of and what it can't be made of. And does God really mind? Does, he God, does it really matter? Well, yes, it does. Because otherwise it's just like that lighting that candle. You're, you're not you're just lighting otherwise if what you're doing falls outside of the scope of what we call halacha in jewish law then all you're doing is lighting candles you're not lighting the menorah you're not lighting the chanakir so all of what the torah and the old law is trying to do is trying to establish those boundaries put a ring fence around the torah um which is the uh, as per the first missioner in, in the barrack of people of us and the missioner of, of, of the ethics of the fathers tells us to do to put a fence around it to understand what is and outside what is inside the scope of the Torah and what is outside. The Torah, as we broadly understand it, um, consists of two parts, if you like. There's the narratives, the stories, and there's the laws. The narratives, the stories, the story of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Moses, children of Israel coming out of Egypt, Sinai, wanderings in the desert, leading to the land of Israel and so on. They are there to give practical applications of that, of of what we've just said in terms of moral lessons, ethical lessons, human interactions. 
And yes, they show the patriarchs and the children of Israel and their leaders as being human beings subject to the um, the frailties that we all suffer as as uh, we're all subject to as as human beings, as conscious, com uh, sentient human beings with a with a moral free will. Um, they're there perhaps to give us inspiration, support, encouragement. Um, but there are there are stories there for all occasions, um, right from you know the troubling times of Job, right through to the the happy times and the simchas, the uh, the the celebrations that we have throughout the the stories of Genesis. But there are also the laws, um, and these are categorised as laws between ourselves and each other. Between man and his friend and his counterpart, um, and between our laws between us and Hashem. But it should be noted that that, that division is, is fairly arbitrary because, on the surface, they may seem that way, but actually, the two are intertwined. By honouring our parents, by being ethical in business, by keeping honest weights and measures, as it says in, 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 in the Torah, and being, being kind and considerate and respectful and giving charity, not only does that bring us closer to each other, but it helps with our relation. There's a spiritual dimension to it as well, because that brings us closer to God. By aligning ourselves with this rule book, by following these rules, even though on the surface it may seem that we're only doing it to, to create sort of social harmony, if you like, and cohesiveness and the family units and all of that sort of thing. But that also has a, has a, has a spiritual dimension to it that helps bring us closer to God. The flip side is that we believe by having a closer relationship to God, that makes us better people. That informs our judgment better. That gives us a higher sense of purpose, a higher sense of meaning in our lives. And that also helps us in our human interactions as well, because we get to see beyond the, the sort of day to day frailties and the, 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 the mistakes people make and the, the, the stuff that we get thrown at us. And it makes us better at, at dealing with, with all of these, these vicissitudes of life, if you like. So the two are very much intertwined and they both come together to make us bring us closer to God, to bring us closer to each other and to make us better human beings. I should say that Midrash kind of sits in between those two. And that sort of out of the Midrash springs the oral law and the Torah and, 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 and all of that as well. Because the Midrash sort of builds on the stories to give us either halachic um, applications, practical applications, or but also to, to add details to the story that help us to understand, to get to bring more symbolism, to connect the stories together um, and to show how they, fo they form part of a, a broader blueprint of the, of the Torah itself and how one story relates to another, even though they seemingly on the surface seem quite different or in different parts of the, of the Torah. It's part that I find particularly fascinating when we see patterns emerging, stories being repeated where there's key parts of the there's parts of the story which seem to be superfluous or details in there that that we might not have noticed, but actually that detail is like a hook that links that part of the story or a symbol that links that part of the story to another part of the Torah and shows how the two come together and perhaps one is a is a is a parallel of the other or a rectification of the other or a reenactment of the other or whatever it is. At the end of the day, it's about, as I say, the Torah, by aligning ourselves with the Torah, we are able to align ourselves with that process of creation and to bring ourselves closer in line with the ways of Hashem, with ways of God. And if I want to summarize, um, I think I'd say my view on the Torah is it's what we as Jews are. At the end of the day, um, each culture, each civilization, each ideology has to have give a case has to have something that they contribute to the broader um, broader civilization the broader arc of human history if you like and for jews um i think it's the torah and i think if we look at what contribution the torah has made to human civilization 
things like human civil rights, um, the, 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 the rule of law, um, the, the uh, property ownership, the, the, un the family unit um, as a basis for society. I think we've got a lot to be proud of. Thanks for watching.